So one of Jesus' disciples named Simon, he confessed that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus renamed him as he renamed people and God has renamed people over the time. He renamed him Peter. And in the Bible we have a couple of books named Peter. And so we are going to start looking at a book called First Peter, a letter written by Peter to the people. And it doesn't matter if we finish all the words on your paper right now, because we're going to just kind of work through First Peter, and wherever we stop, we'll go ahead and continue through First Peter. And so we'll do that next week. So starting out with <clears throat> First Peter 1, and each of the numbered items on your paper are individual verses from First Peter. So First Peter 1 is First Peter chapter 1, verse 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Now, I said Peter was a disciple. Disciples are people who are followers of someone or something. Somebody could say that they were a disciple of crochet. I mean, they're just devoted to learning about crochet, everything about there is. They could say they're a disciple of that. Peter was a disciple of Jesus. Now he calls himself an apostle. Apostle means someone who's sent. This day and age, some people who are ministers claim to be apostles. They've been sent. Some people are offended by that because they believe that only the followers of Jesus who saw him can claim to be an apostle. And in that, of course, that would mean the apostle Paul, who never saw him while he was alive, couldn't be called an apostle. However, Jesus did appear to Paul after Jesus had died and been resurrected from the dead. So others say, yes, Paul can be an apostle because Jesus actually appeared to him. However you want to call it, apostle means someone who has been sent by God and has a purpose of revealing what God had said. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered through Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. He's writing this to the people he called strangers. Uh, I know that we are stranger than most, and I do understand that. These people who are strangers, that's actually the word that you would use for aliens. And so uh, we can talk about aliens from other countries that come to hear aliens that are not a part of the place where they are living. These people have now believed on Jesus Christ, received him as Savior, and they're no longer just humans. You, if you believe on Jesus, if you've asked him to come into your life and have received him as Savior and been born again, you're not in the line of Adam anymore. You're not really even human anymore. You're different. You're aliens here in this world. You don't fit in anymore. The world is no longer your home. You're just stuck here for a while. And so the aliens, the strangers who are scattered, I picked up a verse, Mark 14, 27. Jesus said, he quoted the Old Testament here. Jesus said unto his people, his, his disciples and others, all ye shall be offended because of me this night. For it's written, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. So in this, Jesus was laying hold and claiming to be the subject of the prophecy written by Zechariah 13, 7, Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, against the man that is my fellow, saith the Lord of hosts. Smite the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. This is a message talking about the Messiah. I find it interesting against my shepherd, the man that's my fellow. Here's God claiming that someone who is his fellow, that would be Jesus. Who else is going to be the fellow of God? In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, was God, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. He was the fellow of God, a part of God here in the flesh. 
this prophecy claiming to speak about the Messiah, who was the shepherd. John 10, 11, Jesus speaking, I am the good shepherd, the good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. And so all of those verses go together. The good shepherd who is God in the flesh is smitten uh, for us on our behalf and as such him being smitten, what does that do to his sheep? The sheep are scattered and they become the strangers who are out in the world. But there's a positive thing when people are scattered. When the disciples were scattered, they spread the gospel to many places. If the disciples hadn't been scattered, they would have just been right there in Jerusalem and Christianity would not have spread the same way that it did. So it may seem like a bad thing, but it turns out being a good thing. So Jesus laid claim to this prophecy. He, as the shepherd, would be smitten. He would die on the cross in our place, and he would be resurrected from the dead. And the disciples believed, and they were scattered. Next, 1 Peter 1, 2. Those people who are scattered are elect, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. This is the end of a salutation. You know, Peter's writing a letter and he introduces his letter saying who he's speaking to. He's calling these people elect. You are elect. All those who believe on Christ and have received him as Savior are elect. They're the chosen out of the world God looked at you and saw that you had the ability to have faith because of how you responded. You heard the gospel. You received Christ as Savior. That makes you elect. It makes you special. It makes you chosen from out amongst all the people because you believe. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit. Sanctified sanctification just means set apart for God's use. You've been sanctified. And the Holy Spirit is the one that sets you apart for God's use. And the Holy Spirit has set you apart to be obedient unto the Lord. God wants you to be obedient. I, am, uh, I went and took a picture of our puppy sitting in the back, little Jasper. And I uh, snapped that picture while he was laying there with his head down, being obedient. He was obedient, and I didn't know I was going to tell this story, but he was obedient this week. He's learning to behave all the time like a um, service dog. Learning to be like a service dog. So we took him into the grocery store. He walks right beside me as we walk around the grocery store. Beth Ann bought what we needed to get. We started, we left the line where we had paid for stuff and started moving towards where the door would be up at Strax. And here comes a man with a toddler. He's not holding him. And this toddler is running full blast as fast as he can go, yelling, you know, puppy, 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 puppy. And I said to Jasper, sit. And he sat right beside me. And this kid ran right up to him full speed and put his hand on his nose. <laughs> and I mean, Jasper, even though Jasper is small, he just sat there and didn't move. I mean, and that was really great. He did what he was supposed to do. If that was not someone who was being trained and had been taught to be obedient, he could have bit him. He might have jumped up on him and knocked him down. God wants us to be like that. He wants us to be obedient. The Holy Spirit... Um, understand that there aren't any commas when this was written originally. Translated into English, they put commas there. But this actually says, elect according to, you know, through the sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience. There's no comma actually there. That was put in by the people who translated it. The setting apart of you by the Spirit unto obedience. God has set you apart to be obedient to his spirit. He wants you to walk after what his spirit has told you to do, convicted you, convinced you in your heart. 
unto obedience, that's one, and through the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. When they purified things, for example, when they even offered the blood of the sacrifice once a year, sprinkling it onto the Ark of the Covenant. They did not make a big pool of blood inside of a vat, bring the Ark out, and dip the Ark into the blood and pull it out. They did not take people or things to sanctify them and set them apart for God's use and dip them into a bucket of blood. They would take the blood and sprinkle it. And so they would walk into the, into the holy of holies, the most holy place, and sprinkle the blood on the altar and God would see the blood and he'd declare their sins forgiven for that year. And so here, a sprinkling of the blood of Christ. One drop of Christ's blood is more than enough to sanctify me, to set me apart. I mean, all he had to do, but it, he died in our place, took his own blood there to pay the price for us into the presence of God. But here, it's sanctification of the Spirit, obedience unto that Spirit, and the sprinkling of the blood of Christ. So, next, Matthew 24, 24. Understand that when I said elect, that doesn't mean that you aren't tempted. That doesn't mean that you, you couldn't decide to not walk after the Spirit. It doesn't mean that you might be selfish. Matthew 24, 24 says, false Christ will arise. False prophets are going to arise. They will show great signs and wonders in so much that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. That's something Beth Ann prays about all the time. Oh Lord, please don't let me be deceived. Don't let me, don't let me be deceived. There have already been a number of people over the years who have claimed that they were Jesus Christ. I have been at a campground where someone at the campground who worked there claimed that they were Jesus. And I talked with them and uh, the people at the campground were very distressed about this person claiming that he actually was Jesus now returned. And I believe that to be a mental problem that this person was having, as opposed to him actually being Jesus. Jesus is not going to be reborn into another person. Jesus, when he returns, he's going to return in the clouds and we will see him. I hope that we are going to be caught up in the clouds with him before the tribulation starts. But right now, there will be these people, they will show up, they will be false prophets, they will be these people who claim to be Jesus. If got to understand, if somebody says to you, oh my goodness, Jesus is here, come with me, we're going to drive to California where he's appeared. <laughs> you know, amongst the flood, I guess. Yeah. You know, but don't, don't listen to him. Jesus will show up, that'll be fine. I'm hoping that he will show up even very soon, but don't be deceived. So Peter goes right on then, honoring God in the next verse, 1 Peter 1, 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his abundant mercy, who has begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, from, of Jesus Christ from the dead. So he's saying to these people, God is the greatest. Blessed be the Lord. He is the absolute best. Think of what he's done for us. Blessed be the Lord who has, because of Jesus, through Jesus and his mercy, begotten us again. All of us who believe we've been begotten again to a lively hope. I have a lively hope. It's not like, I hope it doesn't rain while we're driving today. It's not like, well, I sure hope it would warm up soon. I'm tired of this cold weather already. See, that's just, that's kind of like wishes, if wishes were horses. This lively hope, this is something that goes way deeper than that. I have a wonderful, supportive, exciting, inside of me hope that Jesus has accomplished what he said he was doing and that through faith in him, 
I have eternal life. That hope lives inside of me, and it lives inside of all of you. You just have to let that hope come out. It's a blessed thing. God has had mercy. He has begotten us again. Through the resurrection of Christ, we have this hope because we believe. Psalm 103, Old Testament, testifying of how much mercy God has. The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. And God's mercy just keeps on going. Mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. And even though the children of Adam were cursed, when we're born again, we're no longer a part of the children of Adam. John 3.3, 3, Jesus answered and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except the man be born again, he can't see the kingdom of God. All of the people in Adam's lineage were cursed. God said to Adam in the Garden of Eden, Cursed is the very ground for your sake. He was made from ground. That's where he came from. All of his generations were made from ground. And all the ground in all of us was cursed. Eve, I don't believe, was cursed because was Eve made from the ground, by the way? She was made from Adam. I always wondered why in my head, why didn't God just go ahead and make Eve? Created Adam. Why not just grab some more ground, make Eve? Breathe into her the breath of life. No, instead he took something from Adam to make Eve. She wasn't made from the ground, she was made from him. And I, I think that might have something to do with the fact that she wasn't cursed. So Jesus could be born of the virgin, not in Adam's lineage, born of the virgin and not have original sin. Jesus was sin free, even in his birth, because he was born of the virgin. And so here we are. John 3, 3, born again. If you're not born again, then you're not a part of the family of God. If you're not born again, then you are still a part of Adam's lineage. You have to be born again. And concerning hope, Titus 2, 13, we're looking for that blessed hope, the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. I've done a number of, <coughs> number of different messages that included the fact that I said that Jesus is God. Some people don't believe that that's true. They say, oh, he's the son of God. But no, Jesus is God. Right here, Titus just says, the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. He's the great God. He's our Savior and he's the great God. And he has a Father who's also the great God. He has the Holy Spirit who he is the son of, who is God. So I do have that lively hope. 1 Corinthians 15, 20, also supporting that. Christ is risen from the dead, became the first fruits of them that slept. He was the first. I don't know how far down the line I'm going to be because I don't know. I mean, there's been, what, 9 billion people that we know of born in the world, something along that 8 to 9 billion people ever from the beginning of the history of mankind that we know of. Don't know how many of those were resurrected when, after Jesus' resurrection. Don't know how many are going to be saved from here on. Jesus was the first resurrected from the dead into that everlasting body. I don't care if I'm number 7,999,000,000. I just know that I'm going to be there. You're going to be there if you believe. Doesn't matter what number you are, he was first. Even if he, unless he tarries, I'm going to be resurrected from the dead. Otherwise, if he tarries, I'm going to be caught up with him and won't taste death. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 4. We are having that lively, blessed hope in Christ, in his mercy, because he's resurrected from the dead. And we are going to be resurrected to an inheritance, incorruptible, undefiled, that fadeth not away. I know that history has shown that when people get an inheritance, most of the time, it's gone very quickly. I don't know if you've ever seen anyone talking about people who've won the lottery. I mentioned the lottery. You know, there was, it was like $1.3 billion that some, one ticket was sold out in Maine on the news. They said $1.3 billion for the lottery. 
there's a show on TV, which I actually haven't watched, but it's about lottery nightmares. These people win the lottery, and two years later, they're broke on drugs, in jail. It was not a blessing to them at all. All that money and everything, they just blew it. I saw someone on the news say, well, if you won the lottery, you should get your ticket to Las Vegas. I mean, why would I get your ticket? You win the lottery, you got all this money, and now you go out to Las Vegas so you can blow it in the casinos? I mean, this just stupidity. But an inheritance in God, incorruptible, not going to fade away, undefiled. It's reserved for us in heaven. It's in the bank. Your inheritance is already in the bank of heaven. You get to have it, and it's not going to be blown. Romans 8, 17 talks that if we are children of God, then we are heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. You're a joint heir. A joint heir with Christ. He has it all. Everything belongs to him, and you get to share that with him. And he that under Revelation 21 7, he that overcometh will inherit all things, and I will be their God, and he shall be my son. It only happens if you overcome, but you have to overcome the world in order to believe on Jesus Christ. The world is saying, oh, this is just a fairy tale. The word is saying, oh, the Bible's not true. The word is saying this whole story about Adam and Eve, this whole story about anything, all of that's just irrelevant. It's unimportant because it doesn't mean anything. The world just keeps pounding away at you with all of this stuff. If you overcome and believe on Jesus, have him in your life, you get to inherit all things oh, according to the word of God. 1 Peter 1, 5. Those who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed at the last time. God keeps us from failure. We are kept by the power of God through faith. He keeps us unto salvation. Romans 1, 16 says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation. The gospel of Christ is the power of God that keeps us unto salvation. The gospel of Christ is for everyone that believes gets kept unto salvation. The Lord is ministering unto us through faith in the gospel of Christ. That's the real power of God. 1 Peter 1, 6. Wherein we greatly rejoice, though now, if need be, you are in heaviness through manifold temptations. I am really happy that I'm saved. I hope you are really happy that you're saved. I mean, this world is just full of, full of toil and pain and sorrow and distress and sadness and brokenness. And everywhere you turn, there's a... I make a joke out of it. Everywhere I turn, when we walk through the, when we walk through the grocery store, there's another bag of powdered sugar donuts. <laughs> I mean, every time, every time we try and watch good shows on TV, like Hallmark Channel and Great American, uh, Great American Christmas, the Great American Channel, um, and I'm watching that, and even on Great American Channel, I'm watching that, and the main heroine of the show has worn this dress down just above her nipples, and then she bends over like this to talk to somebody, and of course the camera's zooming in. I don't need to look at that. I don't need to look at that. And it's, it's a part of the world that's just that constant temptation to have an evil thought in my mind or, or cause me to stumble or offend, cause me to desire something that God hasn't laid out for me. Every temptation in the world comes after us. And... It's heaviness. I don't like dealing with that every day. I can't stand it. Habakkuk 3, 18. I will rejoice in the Lord. That's where my joy is. The joy that comes 
from the God of my salvation. Psalms 119.28, yet my soul melteth for heaviness. Wow, that's a, that's a really good description. Ever have so many things going wrong and so many temptations in your life and so many things that, I mean, you know that you shouldn't do, but that you keep being drawn to do so many times that you just feel like chucking it. Maybe God doesn't actually love me. And look at that. My soul melts. I'm so heavy with all this garbage that comes in this world. It's melting my soul. Psalm 119, 28. That's a really good description. 1 Peter 1, 7. But the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perishes, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto the praise, honor, and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. You ever hear you can't take it with you? I bet you have. Amass a whole bunch of gold, you can't take it with you. You know what you can take with you? The trial of your faith. Every one of those times that you are tempted to stop believing, every one of those times that you are tempted to do what you know God does not want you to do, it's just like, here's the teller in heaven. I'm looking down, ooh, he turned away from that. ka -ching, a deposit into your inheritance in heaven. Every time that something comes at you and, and you feel inside like just forget it, I'm, I'm going to just give up, and you don't. ka -ching. The trial of your faith is more precious than gold. And that's a part of that inheritance that you get. More precious than gold, and it's going to be found to praise and honor and glory. You're going to be rewarded. You're going to be... You're going to be honored by God for not giving up. When Jesus appears at the appearance of Jesus Christ there in 1 Peter 1, 7. James 1, 12 speaks of it. Blessed is the man that endures that temptation. When he is tried, he will receive a crown of life that the, that the Lord hath promised to those that love him. You get a crown. Have you ever worn a crown? Maybe years ago when you went to Burger King. <laughs> this one's a real crown, a real crown made out of gold that God's going to give you. A crown of life. We get to rule and reign with Jesus, and we endure that temptation. We go through trouble here. We go through trials here. I think about how several years ago, she could probably tell me right away how many years ago, Beth Ann had double knee replacement. And now, two years in a row, she's won the city bowling championship in Lafayette, and she became Lafayette city champion. She has won the Indiana state bowling championship and became Indiana state champion and got to bowl in the national championship in which she placed pretty high really close to winning the, uh, a spot in the, in the top ones, but it was close. We sat down, and I said to her, and she agreed with me, you've got six weeks of terrible, awful, painful work here, and six months of things not being very good, but this is for the rest of your life. You put in those six weeks of awful pain and don't quit. And those six months of difficulty and don't give up. And in the end, look what's going to be for the rest of your life. And, and she, she held on. That's the way it is with us, with God. You've got how long? 90 years of life or 100 years of life here in this world? How much of that time have you been a Christian? Maybe 70, maybe 60. It's hard to say, but you, you put up with all of that trash in the world and all of the temptations the world hits you with and all the things that the devil wants you to do, all the ways he wants you to quit and give up. You, you go through all of that, but what are you doing it for? 
an eternity of blessing, an eternity of being with God and, and streets that have pavement made out of gold in New Jerusalem. <clears throat> and so you're going to receive a crown of life. And Romans 8.18 says, I reckon that the sufferings of this present time aren't worthy to be compared to the glory that's going to be revealed in us. The stuff you have to go through now, I mean, it's just not worthy to be compared to what you're going to get in the end. Praise God for that. 1 Peter 1.8 Jesus, whom you have not seen, yet you love, in whom, though now you see him not, yet believing, you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. There's all kinds of things that you probably have not seen. I have not seen... Uh, <coughs> Maybe, maybe you haven't seen the moons of Jupiter. Maybe you've never seen a, a baby mountain goat. There's all kinds of things that you haven't seen, and yet you know they're there. You can't see gravity. You know that it works because when you jump, you don't launch yourself into space. There's kinds of, all kinds of things that you haven't seen, and yet at the same time, you believe that they're there. I haven't seen Jesus. I, I right now cannot see my car up at the house. I just believe that it's there. It was there before. I, I, I haven't seen him. You haven't seen him, and yet I love Jesus, what he did for me. So even though we don't see him right now, I rejoice. I have great joy inside, joy unspeakable, full of glory because of what he's done for me, even though I haven't seen him. John 1 says a similar thing. No man has seen God at any time, but the only begotten Son, whom is in the bosom of the Father, has declared him. Jesus declared the Father here. Disciples come to him and say, show us the Father. And he says, have I been here so long you don't recognize who I am? I mean, it was the Son that declared the Father even though he and the Father were one. One God in multiple different parts and personalities. No man has seen God at any time, but they have seen Jesus. By the way, that would mean that the people who saw God in the Old Testament, covered with the blood, they got to go up the mountain and they saw the God of Israel, who would that have been? Had to be Jesus. Jesus was the one who was here interacting with mankind in the Old Testament, not the Father. Because no man's seen the Father at any time. But we receive the end of our faith, 1 Peter 1, 9, the end of our faith that is the salvation of our souls. We don't get to see that. We don't get to receive it until we die. You're going to close your eyes, you're going to die. The truck's going to come and smash you. And you're going to grab your chest. I don't know what's going to happen to you, but however it is, in the end, as long as you, I mean, just keep believing, you're going to receive what God's promised. At the end of your faith, salvation of your souls. At the end of your faith, you'll have it, Romans 6.22 says a, a similar thing. But now being made free from sin and become the servants of God, you have your fruit unto holiness and the end, eternal life. You've been given eternal life, but you don't get to experience it until the end. Most of you don't want to have eternal life how you are right now. I mean, in the end, you want to have eternal life in your new body like Jesus has that never gets sick, never grows old. I mean, that's the kind of eternal life we're looking forward to. 1 Peter 1.10 Of which salvation, the salvation that comes at the end, the prophets have inquired and searched diligently who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. People who are prophets. Prophe prophecy can be forthtelling where somebody's telling you a truth or foretelling where they're telling you a prediction um, of the grace that we have. Prophesied of the grace that we were deceived in Christ. Genesis 6, 8 says, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. 
you can think through, I mean, David found grace in the eyes of the Lord. There's all kinds of people in the Old Testament who found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Guess what? You have found grace in the eyes of the Lord if you believe on Jesus, because he's willing to forgive your sins, give you eternity. It's the grace that the prophets searched for. 1 Peter 1.11 those prophets searching also for what manner of time the Spirit of Christ, who was in them, did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that would follow. There is an exact date prophesied in the Bible that is difficult to work out, but it's there. It's in Daniel 9.25. These prophets searched for beforehand about the sufferings of Christ and the glory that was going to follow. Daniel 9, 25. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem unto the Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks, and the street will be built again, the wall, and even in troublesome times. You can actually take when Jesus is crucified and look backwards and count out the years with a day of the Lord and a week being seven days, a week being seven years, you can actually count that back and find the time of the crucifixion. I've done it before a number of years ago. It's complicated, and I don't think anybody actually enjoyed watching me put the numbers on the board and add it up. It just, it takes a long time. Some of you may have been here when I did that, but it is a prophecy that was spoken in the Old Testament and the prophets diligently searched for that. Revelation 19, though, describes the glory that's going to follow. Anytime I get a chance to put this verse in, I'd like to put it in. The vision of John concerning Jesus. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. As Jesus is coming in the clouds to lay foot on the earth and establish his kingdom forever. First Peter, a good book in the Bible. I hope that we enjoy the entire thing. Amen? Amen. If you've never prayed and received Christ as Savior, maybe you just need to renew your faith in him. Won't you pray this prayer with me? You don't have to say the words out loud. Just think them in your heart and mind and say, Heavenly Father, just think it after me. Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus. I know he died on the cross for me. I believe he came back from the dead. I pray you'd come into my life. Forgive my sins. I receive Jesus as my Savior. And I give my life to you. And thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So glad that you came out today. I'd rather you stay and just pray with us. If you want to come up and help us pray, we're going to pray for Dan.